Paul's letter to the Hebrew people in the 12th chapter. I'll read once again verses 1 through 2 and then verses 18 through 29. Paul writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for gathering us together today for the opportunity to worship and to fellowship and to praise your name. And I just pray, O oh God, that your spirit would be upon us. Open our ears so that we could hear your voice. Open our minds to help us understand your word. Help us hear what you want us to hear. Show us what you want us to do so that we can shine our light for you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I have to start by saying it is a joy for me to be here this morning. I was thrilled when Terry invited me to speak today. Um, I met Terry when I was 19 years old. I was working at uh, West River Church Camp, and she was a counselor for the deaf and blind camp, and I'm just trying to wrap my mind around that that was 31 years ago. It's good to see my grandparents are here this morning. <laughs> I would always joke with Terry that she was my mom in most of the most inconvenient places for her. But in that time, she has been a mentor, she has been a colleague, most importantly, she's been a friend. She stood with me when I was ordained elder, and I have cherished her friendship ever since. I'm also grateful to see a lot of familiar faces. You haven't aged a bit. It's hard to believe it's been 11 years. There are some days it seems like forever ago, and some days it just seems like yesterday. As we were driving in, I was thinking to myself and thinking to myself this past week and realizing how young Michelle and I were when we arrived here in 2001 carrying our daughter, Tori, who was just one at the time. She took her first steps in this building. I remember Amanda was watching her. Michelle and I were at some gathering in the parlor and Amanda Beard was watching Tori down when the nursery was downstairs and she just came running up carrying Tori and said, watch! And Tori did nothing. <laughs> and then she took her second set of first steps in this building. And now we just dropped her off to start her sophomore year in college. I am constantly reminded that I am not a young kid anymore. OK, I'm still a kid. I'm just not young anymore. 
Michelle and I just got back from a vacation after we dropped Tori off at college where we were going to embrace once again this empty nesting idea, which is awesome. And um, we dropped her off at college and we got on a cruise ship and the first night we were there, we took our seats at our assigned dinner table and we realized we were at a table for six. And so we were looking around the room wondering who were they going to sit with us and I asked Michelle, so who do you think they're going to sit with us? And she looked around the room, she said, probably some old people. And then the four other guests arrive and sat down, all of them in their late 20s and early 30s, and we realized quickly we were the old people <laughs> at the table. Ouch. So this is our second cruise in 21 years. We're regulars now. And how it has changed, I remember the first time we went on our cruise, we worked, uh, we went with a group, we worked with the group travel agent who planned everything down to where we would eat, where we would go, down to every last detail. This time we did it all ourselves, going online, visiting a number of travel websites, the cruise websites, finding the best deals that we could. And then that got me thinking, this is how my brain works, of um, my family vacations growing up. When you are in a family of six people, you don't go anywhere fancy for summer vacation. You load the family truckster just like out of the movie uh, Vacation with the Griswolds, and you go visit other family members. And I would remember my dad would get out the atlas. For those of you of a certain age, it is a book with maps in it <laughs> of the entire country that's this big. It's huge. And he would trace out our route, and he would trace out our route based on where all the Motel 6s were located. Because we would drive anywhere from two to three days to go visit family, and my dad would not base the distance of the day on hours or on miles. He would base the distance of the day on how tired he got, because he was the only one who would, he would allow to drive. And he would only stay in Motel 6s because they were cheap for a family of six, so he had them all marked off the entire route between wherever we were going. Once in a while, once in a very great while, my dad would go wild and go to the AAA and get a trip tick. Remember a trip tick? They would, it's just a piece of paper pretty much, they would highlight in yellow your route and then they would circle the sites they thought you should stop and visit along your trip. And then they would provide reviews. Now we had reviews from family and friends, there was the reviews from AAA, which we did not know at the time were written by employees based on the kickbacks they received from the sites they wanted you to stop and visit. Clueless. We don't plan trips that way anymore. Once in a while, we'll still go to a travel agent, but the internet has changed everything when it comes to trip planning. The internet has allowed sites like TripAdvisor, which was the first social media planning uh, travel planning website that was ever developed in the year 2000, which not only did it allow you to plan your trip, but you could provide and read feedback from people who had been where you're going. TripAdvisor was, is what we call disruptive technology. It changed how we travel, where we travel, and how we plan it. The websites inspired other apps that fit hand in glove with this new approach to viewing the world. I mean, travel has never been the same. With the advent of GPS, how many of you still carry a map in your glove compartment? Well, John, you get lost a lot. <laughs> I mean, you just go here between here and the dump, but you still get lost a lot. The review of experts have been replaced with that fresher perspective of people who have actually been their ordinary travelers. So now on sites like TripAdvisor, Expedia, Booking.com, Travelocity, you can book your particular hotel or your flight, you can rent a car, and you can get advice from a forum of millions of people who share their photos and their experiences and the reviews so you get an idea of what you may see if you go to where they've been. However, despite all the advice you can now get about a particular destination, you still have to go there to experience it fully for yourself. The writer of Hebrews 
this morning offers us a review of two different destinations that are in stark contrast in quality. And the writer, Paul, recognizes that the Bible is actually a story from the beginning to the end of a journey, a journey that begins in the Garden of Eden and ends in a second garden. And this metaphor of journey, this metaphor of the hero's quest is constantly at play as you read through each individual book in the Bible. In Genesis, we encounter a man who is called by God to travel to a country of which he knows nothing about. And he does it based on faith alone, not based on advice from AAA or TripAdvisor. Abram, Abraham and his family travel from Ur to Canaan. They took a side trip to Egypt and then back again. His grandson, Jacob, also took a journey to Egypt, not to see the pyramids uh, during construction, but to reunite with his long-lost son, Joseph. Centuries later, Jacob's descendants journeyed from Egypt into the wilderness, and finally, 40 years later, ended up in what they called the Promised Land. Centuries after that, their descendants were unwillingly carried off into Babylon, where they sat for 70 years until they were allowed to journey back to Israel. And finally, we get to Jesus, who never really traveled far from his hometown, but he made the journey of a lifetime to Jerusalem and to the cross and to the tomb and eventually to the resurrection. Finally, this journey motif is highlighted in the 11th chapter of Hebrew, where the journey of the Christian uh, community, the Christian church, is compared to a sojourn in a strange country. Believers understand that this world is our temporary home and that our true citizenship is in heaven, and the writer of Hebrews uh, equates this heaven with what he calls the new Jerusalem, and that's towards which we're traveling. But before we get there, we have to do what's called a red-green comparison. If you go to TripAdvisor, you would notice that their logo is an owl, a symbol of wisdom. And if you look closely, the owl has two different colored eyes. It's got a red eye and a green eye. And the colors symbolize the way travelers choose their planning. Green is someplace they want to go. Red is someplace they want to stay away from. And choosing wisely is an art form that can make the difference in the quality of our journey. And so in verses 18 through 24 of what we heard from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, the writer contrasts the quality of Israel's journey to um, encounter God at Mount Sinai during the Exodus to what the Christian experiences on their spiritual journey toward encountering God. One journey is where the review reveals a sense of fear and foreboding, while the other journey, the other destination, gets five-star reviews every single time. And in verses 1 through 2, I'm really glad Debbie started with that. After, in the chapter preceding, uh, chapter 12, the writer goes through a litany of all of the faithful people in scripture who have gone on this journey with God, the writer urges the reader to repeatedly press on with the journey of faith, to run with perseverance that race that is set before us with Jesus who endured his own journey to the cross as our example. The writer reminds us the journey won't always be easy, but the destination will always be worth it. And it's important to keep that sense of perseverance in mind. To see the journey not as a burden. It's not a repeat of Israel's journey in Exodus. Their journey to Mount Sinai ended with them hearing God's voice. But when they heard God's voice, they were so terrified that they begged Moses to not let God speak to them again. The journey that they experienced was a journey that ended to a God whose access was restricted. It's like planning your trip to your dream destination only to find out that it's closed. How many of you saw um, National Lampoon's Vacation? The Griswolds 
sorry folks, the moose at the front of the park should have told you were closed. It was like uh, 2017. I took Michelle for what we called our 50-25 journey. Um, someone's 50th birthday, not mine. And someone's 25th anniversary, mine. And um, we went to Paris. And she wanted to go see Versailles. And so Michelle, because she enjoys it so much, planned the entire Paris trip. And we, we uh, left our hotel, we walked and took one train, took a train to kind of a metro center, got onto another train, got to Versailles, had to walk three million blocks, I think it was, um, to the palace, and walked up and no one was in line. And we were overjoyed. <laughs> Sorry folks, the moose out front should have told you we were closed. What someone did not look in her online reviews is that Versailles is closed on Mondays. <laughs> not that I'm bitter. We thought we hit the jackpot when we hit the big zero until the next day we decided to go back and so did everybody else in all of France. But when the Israelites heard God's voice, then God gave them the law through Moses at Mount Sinai. And while the law gave them particular direction for how to live in community and how to deal with the relationship with God and the relationship with one another, the Israelites chose to focus more on the law than on the God behind the laws. And so in addition to that top 10 that God gave them, the Jewish leaders created an additional 603 laws surrounding it just to protect themselves from ever getting close to breaking one of the top 10. Yet with 613 laws at their disposal, they were still prone to wander, prone to complain, and prone to fall short. I mean, even when they reached the promised land, they were still searching for their ultimate destination, one which was blocked by a curtain in the temple, not allowing them full access to God. This was a trip that was necessary in order to get to full access to God, and it's like a trip you can't really appreciate. It's like you can't appreciate a good hotel room until you've stayed in a really bad hotel room. So the writer of Hebrews describes the journey of the Israelites and the giving of the law as an experience that's in the need of an upgrade, an upgrade that was freely offered through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, notice the contrast that Paul lays out in his reviews of the two experiences at Mount Sinai. When the Israelites get to Mount Sinai, they were told to expect to find fear and darkness, gloom and travel. I mean, sign me up. I'm ready to go. But then when he talks about the Christian's journey to the New Jerusalem and the ultimate destination of those who per uh, persevere in faith in Christ, he describes a place where we'll meet innumerable angels in festal gathering, a place where we'll see the assembly of firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, a place where we'll experience God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and most importantly, we'll meet Jesus, the mediator of this new covenant. But it's not enough just to read the review. To experience the destination, you actually have to go there. You have to take this journey of a lifetime. The writer of Hebrews urges us to, to listen to God's voice and to heed what God says. I mean, that's nothing new. God's been speaking to God's people for eons. We're just reluctant to listen. Let's hear again verse 25 when Paul talks about how it's in really bad form to interrupt or not listen to God. Paul writes, See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? And discerning that voice from God has been an issue for humanity since the very beginning. The Bible is full of those stories of people who have been called or heard the voice of God. Abram hanging out in Haran told to go to a land that I will show you. Moses tending sheep in the middle of nowhere, 
uh, spoken to out of a burning bush. Samuel, a little boy sleeping on a cot in the temple when he heard a voice calling his name. Isaiah in another temple when he heard God's voice said, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Elijah hiding in the cleft of a mountain who heard the still small voice of God. And then there's our text from this morning, Jeremiah, the boy. He hears a voice and decides to get interactive with it. The voice, of course, is the voice of God, but sometimes I have to wonder, how did these biblical heroes know that it was God's voice? And perhaps most importantly, how did they know they were supposed to answer? I mean, how do we know that we're hearing the voice of God and not just our own inner conversation. Well, Jeremiah gives us a clue. For starters, God's voice is best heard in the context of a community of faith. Jeremiah grew up in a priestly community, and so he would have known the stories about Abraham and Moses and Samuel and all the others who had heard God's call. He would have been schooled in regular prayer. He would have watched as the people within his community poured over the sacred text to determine God's will and God's way for their lives. The voice that Jeremiah heard did not come out of the blue. It came out in the context of a community devoted to God where the people discerned God's voice together. We need to remember that we are wired to hear God's voice best within the context of the faith community. It's a community that can keep us in check, that can help us decide if those inner stirrings are really God's voice or just our own inner conversation. It's gathering with others who help us discern through worship and through prayer and through scripture. It's through connecting with other Christians that we can decide and bounce off, is this God who is speaking to me? God's voice is also best heard in conversation with God. When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah pushed back. He needed to sort out whether this call was coming from God or from himself. If it was coming from himself, he could easily dismiss it. If it was coming from God, he could not discount it. And that's an interesting pattern throughout the Bible. Those who are used most powerfully by God are those who take the time to test God's call with a conversation. And God invites that conversation. We tend to forget that prayer is a two-way street. So often it's just us giving our wants, needs, and desires to God without us taking the time to pause and to listen for God's command in our lives. Regular prayer is this running conversation with God. Or as Debbie said, yes, when I am running, my conversation is with God. God, let this be over. <laughs> I get to leave here today, and later on, I get to do a little run of 18 miles. God, what was I thinking is often a prayer that I recite but much like running a marathon, the Christian journey is not easy. But it's worth it. And don't get caught up with what is God calling me to do. Here's the clue. Here's the secret. God is calling all of us to the exact same thing. God is calling us to take those 613 laws and not boil them down to 10, but to take them down to 2 which Jesus already did for us, so we've kind of got it easy. In Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40, one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? So of those 613, which is the most important? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the, God, the call of God is the same for each and every one of us. Love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. How we live that out is going to be different. 
how we love God through worship and prayer and devotion, how we love our neighbors through acts of mission and acts of justice will look different for you. It's going to look different for me. But that's the beauty of this thing we call the Christian community. In the second century, when Christianity was still a minority religion within the Roman Empire, there was a Roman philosopher named Silas. He was an aggressive antagonist of Christianity, and he wrote scornfully of Christianity being carried forth by what he called wool workers, cobblers, laundry workers, and the most illiterate and bu bucolic yokels. And not much different. But that was Christianity's strength. It was spreading the faith and expressing the love of God through everyday ordinary people. It wasn't the job of, of some professionals, but it was the passion of ordinary people. They are the ones who put legs to our face. And they carried it to places where the general population went each and every day. And that continues to be our challenge. Jesus provides us with a joyful approach to God and God's kingdom. And we're called to hear God's voice and to respond to God's leading. Whenever we worship together, whenever we spur one another on to the perfection of holiness, and when we give thanks to God, we are living in the culture of the kingdom. And that's one destination where the reviews are spectacular. Thanks be to God. Amen.